and okay, we're good. Okay, I just want to make sure I am unmuted. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Kim Mack. Welcome to the 22nd event in the Popular Music Books in Process series, a collaboration between the Journal of Popular Music Studies, IASPM US, and the POP Conference. As always, thank you to my organizers, Eric Weisbart and Carl Wilson. Last week, we had a great conversation between Joanna Love and Steve Waxman about large-scale live music events. And next week, on December 8th, I will be here discussing my forthcoming book, Fictional Blues, Narrative Self-Invention from Bessie Smith to Jack White with Emily Lordy. Uh, and in case you are unaware, you can find previous sessions on Eric Weisbard's YouTube channel. Today, we're excited to have Larissa Kingston Mann here, who will talk about her book that's forthcoming from UNC Press in 2021, titled Rude Citizenship, Jamaican Popular Music, Intellectual Property and Colonial Power. Larissa Kingston Mann is an assistant professor of media studies and production at Temple University. She has a PhD from UC Berkeley Law School and an MSc in economic history from the London School of Economics. And she has been a DJ since 1995. Her scholarship investigates how people build capacities for liberation, especially through their engagement with law and technology, mainly focusing on the role of music and popular culture. She has written about Jamaican popular music, pirate radio, social media, and underground dance music in her investigations so far, although her current interests also include Colombian picos, as well as analyzing AI and surveillance technologies as they intersect with liberatory practices. After the discussion, there'll be a Q&A, which Carl will moderate. Please put your questions in the chat as they come to you, and Carl will find them there at the end of the discussion. So I'll now turn things over to Larissa. Thank you so much, Kim. And uh, thank you uh, for having me at this event. It's been a really uh, inspiring series. I haven't stopped in as, to as many as I would have liked, but the ones I've seen have just been awesome. And it's so great to get a window into people's thought processes. Like I like that it's books in process, not just the finished product. I think it's also very hopeful for those of us who are struggling with creating books. Um, this is my first. So uh, really, it's been great and exciting to be able to talk about that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the book itself and about the process, um, uh, the ongoing process of making it, uh, which has been interesting uh, and also very long, um, as I think is common now in academia uh, for so many of us, because even if we um, finish our uh, graduate programs in a timely manner, the, the space between that and the moment at which we might uh, be able to be paid to write is often very long. That is, most of us end up adjuncting and doing other jobs for a long time, and it's hard at least to produce a book in that context. So anyway, I'm very excited that it is cl much closer to done, um, forthcoming, uh, hopefully, uh, in 2021, um, under revision right now. Um, and uh, I just want to talk first, I want to have a couple thank, thank yous. Um, the first uh, is to uh, my mother, Dr. Esther Kingston Mann, who is also here, um, who has been my greatest support in academia and also uh, uh, one of my scholarly interlocutors as well. So her work really influenced mine and um, you all will see how that happened as I go forward. I also want to thank uh, someone who is not here, who is Andrea Lewis. Um, she is, was my uh, sort of foremost consultant on the ground in Jamaica. Uh, she is a person who has worked in the music industry for a long time uh, and uh, was incredibly helpful to me and supportive over the many visits that I had. Um, and I learned an enormous amount from her and I'm super grateful for all of her time and energy. Uh, she is also uh, someone who has made a living at the margins and intersections of the music industry uh, uh, as a woman, uh, an independent and, and not very traditional woman in the music industry, and is currently also um, uh, fighting cancer. So I'm actually, uh, I, I co-started a GoFundMe with her to support that because she doesn't have any financial support really outside of what she's cleaned together over the years. And I'm just gonna throw that in the chat just in case if any of you enjoy the talk or think about buying the book, you actually could probably put money there first uh, and then um, you know request the book from your library when, it, when the time comes is good too. Um, but I'll just put that GoFundMe in the chat um, because uh, she should be getting a lot more support as should many of the people who I'm gonna be talking about today. 
So I just thought I would share that. Uh, and then another person to thank is Tariq Jabari Perkins, who is another friend in Jamaica who offered me space in which to think, uh, physical space and support in which to think, which is something that when you're doing your field work is often hard, I think, to find at least it was for me. Um, and actually, I should thank someone else who's here, Jack Lerner, who actually introduced me to Andrea Lewis um, uh, and is, who's a good friend as well. So thank you, Jack. Uh, for that, uh, I would definitely be in a different place if I hadn't been introduced to Andrea Lewis. So uh, the little web of support that comes out uh, at different times. So how I came to write this book about Jamaican popular music and copyright law, uh, uh, it's, it seems, um, now it seems inevitable, <laughs> uh, but at the time uh, I was sort of surprising myself at my choices, but it comes out of having been a DJ for 25 years and uh, also the daughter of a historian of peasant land communes and privatization movements, uh, which uh, if you've read some of my work, you will see how those connect, but I'll talk about it in a minute. But basically I became interested in especially how music helped different communities to flourish culturally, economically, emotionally, and in other ways. And that's something that I found as a DJ that certain kinds of musical practices seem to be really important two communities that already existed, um, uh, they came together in certain ways around music that seemed to sustain them, sometimes economically, but also in other ways. Uh, and I also found this to be something that I learned in practice as someone who was involved in activism, that is a lot of explicit political activist projects that were about human flourishing seemed to get to fall apart uh, at the level of sort of social interactions. That is that people would have very clear political programs but couldn't actually find ways to be in community with each other and be in community across things like racial difference and class difference and gender difference and all that kind of thing. Whereas in musical spaces sometimes there was more success. Not always and not inevitably but sometimes there seemed to be more success at moments where people came together across some of these divisions and enacted ways of relating that looked more liberatory and positive from my perspective. And so I was really interested in what are the conditions that allow that kind of thing to happen? And that's someone thing I thought about as a DJ and someone who threw musical events, but I also became interested in how that has happened in different spaces over time. Under what conditions is music making liberatory? And under what conditions can music musical practices be things that help people relate in less oppressive ways. And, and so that, uh, that, that's sort of been an underlying question in a lot of my work when I look at pirate radio, when I look at underground dance music in the US, and when I was doing my field work in Jamaica. Um, what happened first was that I went to the London School of Economics as an economic history major, or economic history master's degree, master's student. And I was interested in the Jamaican music industry. And this was around the time, this was in 1999, this was around the time that, uh, it was a little a few years before, I guess, uh, someone named James Boyle had written an article called The Second Enclosure Movement, uh, in which he had said that the late 90s push to harmonize copyright law globally uh, was similar to the kind of enclosure movements in common land that had happened in places like England and Russia. And I was like, wow, I know about those things because my mother is a historian of common land. And I wonder if that's really true. That seems really interesting. And uh, what became very clear as someone who was involved in music was that the way that people who talked about copyright law in the policy world and, and lawyers talked about it did sound very colonial. That is, there was a state, the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is an international body that advises the World Trade Organization, um, had made statements and policies that basically said every country in the world should have the same system of intellectual property. And if they don't have the system, then their industries and creative industries will not develop. So your music industry has to have a copyright law that looks exactly pretty much like the US copyright, industry, copyright system. And if you don't have that, then your industry will not develop. And as someone who is very familiar with Jamaican music, I was like, that doesn't make any sense just from a historical perspective because there is already a very large music industry in this country and their ways of relating to music and their ways of using music very much contradict what copyright law says should happen. They do not uh, follow the rules that, that this organization says you should 
follow. And yet there is already an industry. So my first research was looking at the history of the Jamaican music industry to see, well, if they weren't enforcing copyright law, what were they doing? Uh, because it seemed on some levels to be very successful and very productive. Uh, and um, so that was kind of the beginning of my interest in this work. Uh, to understand that, I did have to look at copyright law in the US um, and I'll get through the law stuff and back to the music stuff soon, I promise. But <laughs> I did look at copyright law in the US uh, and I'll just say very briefly that the fundamentals of copyright law that are relevant for what I'm talking about are that it requires copyright uh, is an exclusive right. So it is a right that says, if you own a copyright in a creative work, you have the right to stop other people from accessing it. And, or they can come to you for permission and then you can say, well, if you pay me, I'll give you permission. That's the sort of the fundamental relationship to creative works. In order for that to exist, the work has to be recorded in some form. So it has to be written or recorded. So already, we can see that there's a lot of creative traditions that don't involve recordings or writings that copyright law is not going to relate very well to. In fact, this idea that the owners should be, should be exclusive and that they should want to exclude people from using their work is also doesn't fit with a lot of creative traditions, uh, including the Jamaican one. It also functions much better when the owner of a work is an individual, because if work is made collectively, then you have to figure out who is the person you ask for permission. And copyright attaches to works when they are recorded and when they are original. And the definition of original here has to do with being different from what has come before. But a lot of creative traditions rely just as much on reusing and repeating things as they do with differing. It doesn't mean that there's nothing original, but where the original, originality is recognized or visible uh, can be very different from what uh, uh, copyright law and copyright policy tends to recognize. So fixation, exclusivity, individuality, and originality, defined in a very particular way, are at the heart of uh, how US and to a great extent uh, European and British copyright law are, uh, are defined. There are some distinctions uh, in other parts of Europe, but they're not that relevant for Jamaica, so I will leave those aside for now. Um, what all this does is, is focus on the way, if we're talking about music, that it is an object. It is something that is bounded, that has rules about access and circulation, uh, uh, but it doesn't really address the way music is a practice. Uh, and so in places where the manufacture and circulation of objects related to culture or related to music are industrialized on a mass scale, uh, copyright can function pretty well to generate money because you have objects circulating and mass produced and people are charging for access of them and everything is recorded in the sense also people are keeping track of that circulation. But in places where you don't really have mass production of recordings uh, and in places where live engagement with music is really the backbone of, of the culture, copyright is already kind of peripheral to a lot of the, the motivations for why people are engaging with music. And this is something, I'm talking about this kind of backwards from the copyright law perspective. This is something that I was already familiar with, again, as a DJ and as a music lover. And I think anyone who's involved in actual music making can resonate with some of this, that a lot of the reasons why people are putting energy into engaging with music, whether it's as an audience member or as a performer or a creator or a producer or an engineer, all of those things involve breaking those boundaries of what a song is uh, so that it's not a fixed object anymore, but it's a collection of references or a bunch of interactions or ways of engaging in a collective way at the creative level and at the sort of enjoyment level of music. Um, so my experience of music contradicted very much this idea that um, what mattered about music was that it was the collection of recordings controlled by individuals who were granting access or not according to licensing rules. Um, what's interesting is when I started looking at this in relation to copyright, how copyright lawyers talked about it, their language for how musicians and specific, especially Jamaican musicians dealt with copyright law was very familiar to me. They said things like, it's total anarchy, it's the wild west, there's no rules, it's just mayhem. You know, especially again in relation to Jamaica, uh, copyright lawyers and music industry lawyers were like, it's just, it's, it's just madness. There's nothing going on. We have no idea. There's no rules. And I was like, well, first of all, that doesn't feel right to me to, to generalize about 
uh, an entire culture, especially a colonized culture, and say they basically have no rules and no idea about what's going on. But also, if you're familiar with the music, it has a whole lot of structured patterns in it. There's things that happen and things that don't happen. So it's clear that there are rules. They're just not the same rules that the lawyers are looking for. And that is also a historically uh, very colonial dynamic. And one that's also true, for example, in um, dynamics of modernization of, uh, and privatization of peasants' lives, whether colonial or not. That is, an outsider with a lot of power says, oh, look at these people. They have no idea what they're doing. I'm going to come in and I'm going to create modern order. And then after that, everything is going to develop. But that erases the local practices and values on the ground. And in this case, again, what's happening in Jamaica, because I was talking to people in, in the late 1990s, a massive music industry or music scene that was incredibly productive already existed. I mean, Jamaica is disproportionately productive of music, uh, just in terms of number of recordings alone, if you want to fixate on that. And in terms of influence, it's also disproportionately productive. It's a tiny island with not a large population. Uh, and uh, it's, and yet there is a, you know, Jamaican music is, is popular, played, consumed, engaged with at a, you know, on a global scale. So whatever was happening, uh, it wasn't something that hindered productivity. So I was like, okay, I think I need to go there and find out what's happening more uh, with my own experience and my own research. Uh, so I ended up doing uh, about a year of fieldwork living in, in Jamaica, mainly in Kingston. And uh, I was interviewing people. I was attending musical events. I was spending time in recording studios. I talked to a couple lawyers, uh, although they're not that many specific, there weren't that many, interestingly, weren't that many entertainment lawyers on that island, even though there's so much music there, uh, also suggesting that copyright law doesn't seem to be a very uh, important uh, dynamic for people on the ground very much. Uh, and uh, what I found when I went in was that a lot of the theories that I had been studying in the legal world and in the, uh, around copyright didn't really help, really help me understand what was going on on the ground in Jamaica. So there is a whole field of what is sometimes called critical copyright scholarship, where people are saying, oh, copyright law doesn't work the way people think it should, we should change it. Uh, and especially in the late 90s, there was a huge discussion of this following uh, the kind of the, the Napster era and the file sharing era and a bunch of people and also like the era of mashups where people were saying copyright law um, uh, is bad, it privatizes culture, we should make culture common to everybody and then society could flourish. And what I found when I got to Jamaica was that um, the emotional weight behind what people were doing and the things they poured the most energy into didn't fit either this wholly private or this wholly communal kind of narrative about how music functioned. Uh, and so I needed to understand more about what happened, about what was happening, about why people were doing what they were doing. And what I found was, for example, people were not mostly saying that no copyright should ever be enforced on the island. Instead, what people would say, musicians would say this, uh, studios would say this, uh, um, and they would say, yes, we need to enforce copyright. And they would pronounce it that way. They would say copyright. And they would say, it is our, you know, we have rights and we need to be making money from our music and other people profit from our music and we don't profit from it, um, which is all very, very true. Uh, but what I realized was that uh, when they thought about copyrights, they thought about it in terms of them being rights bearing people, people who have, who have the right to make demands on the world and on the state to enforce their needs. When I asked them, well, okay, copyright should be enforced, I noticed that in this song you reuse a piece of music from another song, that would mean you would have to pay them for it. And people would be like, well, that's 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 different. That's not really that's not really what I'm talking about. You know, or uh, in fact most of the DJ events people were not paying uh, music collection agencies for the right to perform or, or replay recordings, which is something that copyright would require. So most of the people who said copyright should be enforced meant that they needed, they and their communities needed to get paid. Not that the rules within copyright needed to be uh, enforced as they were written. There was a, a substantial gap between what people thought should happen and what the rules said should happen, which is not surprising because copyright law in Jamaica uh, uh, stayed the same 
from before independence until 1993. So it was the same copyright law in Jamaica was the British colonial copyright system until well after the whole music industry had developed into a global system after the reggae era, after the dance, you know, in the middle of the dance hall era. Uh, and so that law was not written with local people in mind in any, uh, in any real way. Uh, and so what I started is that, to, is there a question? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry, I think someone's unmuted. Um, so, uh, so my encounters with people often included a lot and, of- uh, I like the heaviness of it. Uh, yeah. I think that's, maybe it's Rob Drew, are you unmuted? Can you mute yourself? I see, I no, thank you. Um, so uh, there were a lot of moments where uh, people seemed to be speaking past copyright law, saying, uh, saying things that the law actually did not have in it, to, to say they wanted things to happen as a matter of copyright enforcement that the law did not actually have in it. It wasn't my job to uh, correct people or educate people on the law, especially because the law wasn't being enforced and isn't likely to be enforced. But I wanted to learn about what, what people's expectations were and why they had them. And what I came to believe was that people were making demands of copyright that were based in their sense of what was right about what their rights were. Uh, and that this actually suggested to me a different way of looking at re relationships between people and relationships between people and the state. That is, people were saying, these are what I should have and what our community should have as rights-bearing people, and we deserve this because of our, of who we are and of our, you know, and they would also talk about um, colonial oppression and being historically and systematically disadvantaged both uh, as black and especially poor black Jamaicans, because the majority of people involved in uh, the popular music scene are not middle or upper class Jamaicans, but poor Jamaicans. Um, but they said, uh, you know, they were they were making claims on the state to respect them in their own practices as their own practices existed. And so this is why I end up calling the book Rude Citizenship, because what it seemed to me clear was that people were not verbally at least rejecting the idea of being citizens or being Jamaicans. They were making claims as people who felt they were owed something by the law and by the state. But the kinds of claims they were making were actually pretty fundamentally incompatible with, with the way the state saw them as people. And I'll, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, how that works in the music industry because it's also interesting uh, the way uh, poor Jamaicans have continued to dominate in the in the Jamaican popular music industry, even as it became globally popular, because that doesn't always uh, stay the same when local scenes become global. Often there's a sort of gentrification effect. And it's not that that never happens or doesn't happen at all, but it didn't happen in the same way in Jamaica. So, so I'm going to change gears for a second to talk about that. So, and this is really where the ethnography part of my work came in in another way, because I spent a lot of time going to dance music events in the 90s. I also have a historical section in the book where I talk about the development of the scene. But the dance music events I went to, uh, in the, especially in the 90s and then in back, and then also in, uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, and then in 2009 when I lived there, to 10 years later, um, uh, were interesting in that they, they were uh, embodiments of a creative tradition it starts in Jamaica, but also became globally influential, which is the tradition of DJ culture itself. So uh, Jamaican popular music starts, uh, and this may be fam very familiar for some of you and then unfamiliar for others. Um, Jamaican popular music really starts uh, in the years before independence, especially in the 1940s uh, and 50s. There's a small uh, um, scene of instrumentalists making something called mento, which sounds a bit like calypso. Uh, it's, and it's similar in the sense also that people are singing kind of witty riffs on the issues of the day and singing body songs and songs about sex and romance and all that kind of thing. But it's mostly, it's mostly not recorded. There's not a lot of studios and there's no record pressing plants on the island. The first record pressing plant, which is a place that vinyl records are pressed because that's the dominant way that recordings are made in the 50s, uh, is in 1954. But it's a pressing plant founded in order to repress foreign records that are popular on the island. So the pressing plant occurs before the recording studio. And this is interesting because it suggests that people are listening to music and recordings from elsewhere 
as popular music. Uh, a lot, you know, there isn't a local music industry that makes recordings. Uh, when a local industry develops in the late 50s and early 60s, it is uh, the, the genre that, that first comes out as sort of a Jamaican genre is ska music. Uh, and it starts out very much influenced by American R&B and music that you can hear on the radio from mostly Texas, Louisiana, Miami, also from the Caribbean, other parts of the Caribbean. Uh, and it starts out with people doing covers, especially of uh, R&B vocal harmony tunes, and then starts to shift into a kind of local sound uh, in, the, in the late uh, 50s and early 60s. And uh, this is also the time when there's a buildup to independence, Jamaican independence. So Jamaican independence is in 62. So the impetus for popular music occurs at the same time as a sense of Jamaican national identity is starting to be politicized and argued for. And the, fir the, the first places that this music gets spread among the public are really place dances where people are dancing, not so much to live bands, but to DJs playing recordings of those live bands. And so this is also really important because people don't buy records, poor people don't buy records to listen to at home. The way that people listen to recordings is in social settings with each other where there is dancing and often alcohol being served. So this is why, uh, even though it's a music industry, it's not an industry that's based in the, or originates with the, circ the mass sale of recordings, because most people aren't buying recordings. They are listening to other people play recordings and they are dancing. And the recording process is very much influenced by the dances. So if you make a, a song as a producer and you play it for the dance and they don't like it, you might go back and make another version of the song until it hits right. Uh, so the dances are also creative input into the, the creative process and a recording isn't really the final product. The moment in the dance is the final product of music. And again, this is, this is all occurring uh, as the sense of what it means to be Jamaican is also being sort of made public for the first time. Jamaican in, in, and not just a British subject, but perhaps an independent identity. Uh, so uh, the other thing that's important is that very quickly when people start having these dances in public places, they start building their own sound system so that the sound can be louder and louder. Uh, and so you very quickly have the rise of what starts to become called sound system culture, which is basically somebody with a turntable or two and some giant speakers and an amplifier, and they start competing over the size and power and tone of their sound systems. But the important thing about sound systems being loud is that that limits where it is you're going to encounter a sound system because wealthy neighborhoods do not, uh, do not want loud sounds in them, basically. And so popular culture occurs in poor neighborhoods because that's where it is possible to set up your giant set speakers and blast music all night, uh, which means that popular culture, uh, popular music, at its heart stays in these poor communities because it is centered on social engagement with music rather than consumption of recordings at home. And you need to have a loud sound system to engage with it properly as people come to understand what proper means in that context. And because that's, that loud sound can't happen and isn't welcome in upper class spaces, poor people end up retaining a kind of authority over popular music uh, in a way that actually continues until very, very recently. It may be changing now to some extent. Uh, that is, there are now starting to be more street dances and sound systems occurring in wealthier parts of town. But up until even through the, the early 2000s, when I was in Kingston uh, for a longer period of time, they really occur, occur in the street, in areas where you can take up space in the street with loud noise. And so this authority stays in poor communities. Uh, and when the music becomes globally popular, it's still difficult for upper classes to absorb this music because, uh, and, and take control of it because to be authentically recognized as part of the culture, you really have to come up through those sound systems and through those street dances and be recognized in those spaces. So you do have Jamaican stars who are middle class, uh, Sean Paul being one example, but he's much more popular outside Jamaica and always has been and isn't really People don't dislike him, but you don't hear his music in the streets very much. Uh, and nobody, people don't normally say, oh, he's middle class, we don't listen to him. But he's just not there. <laughs> and he will say, uh, and I've spoken to him and I've spoken to other people who work with him, that it's, you know, I mean, you don't feel that bad for him, but he's like, it's hard being 
from the middle classes and trying to be in the Jamaican music industry because people don't welcome you. And it's like, well, you know, small violin because his life is a lot easier than a lot of the people in these neighborhoods. But I think uh, it was interesting. Quite a few, I talked to a couple different middle class wannabe vocalists and they said, yeah, you know, you go there and you hang around in the studios and people are just like, you know, they can tell right away that, you, that you're not from here and you're not from the streets and they don't want you here. And so it's not that nobody who isn't poor can show up at the street dances, but you're very much, if you go to these street parties, you're not on your own turf if you're from uptown, if you're from the middle class areas. It is not your space and you can tell that right away. Uh, and so you can be there, but you're not, you can't dictate what happens in the space in the same way. The, the rules of engagement are very much shaped by the communities in that space. And those are not also, related very much to the law. That is, technically there are noise regulations, there are regulations about whether, whether or not you can just have 500 people standing in the middle of a street blocking all the traffic. They're just not really enforced. And part of that, uh, I came to believe, is because of this connection between Jamaican identity and popular music, whereby Jamaicans who are poor and connected to the music have a lot more cultural authority and legitimacy in a certain way than the state does. That is, the state would have a problem if it tried to shut down these practices completely because the state's claims to authority are based in references to British culture and elite culture that are actually not originating on the island. And you can see this also, this tradition or this pattern in the reluctance of the Jamaican government and elite institutions to embrace popular music even as it becomes a huge economic and cultural force. So, for example, the capital city, uh, up until I think just a few years ago, literally a, a few years ago, did not have a dedicated like popular music venue in it. It had spaces like the cricket field that it would repurpose for popular music, but it didn't actually have its own music space for popular music. Uh, national radio, which was the only radio uh, until deregulation in the 90s, did not play music associated uh, with poor people, whatever that genre was at the time, whether it was ska in the 60s or then reggae in the 70s uh, or dance hall in the 80s and 90s, uh, it didn't play it or was extremely reluctant to play it. And there were continual um, uh, critiques and moral panics about the popular music associated with the poor in you know, major newspapers and in scholarship. There is now something called the Reggae Studies Unit in the University of the West Indies, but it has continually been a kind of troubled space that's very difficult to find its footing. It continually gets kind of undercut. It was supposed to be a department and then it became a unit, this kind of thing. So there's always been this very une uneasy relationship with local elites. Um, and to, to pivot back to theory for a second, this is some, something that, one thing that I found really helpful in thinking about how this worked was scholarship by a Jamaican sociologist named Obika Gray, who wrote a book called Demeaned but Empowered, the Social Power of the Urban Poor. And this is, this Obika Gray kind of gave me the concept that I sort of run with in the book, which is the concept of exilic spaces. Um, so I wrote it in the chat just so you can see how it's spelled. So Obika Gray was not writing about popular music, but he was a sociologist writing about the urban poor and about the power of gangsters in Jamaican popular imagination and in politics, because uh, uh, one of the things that um, uh, he observed, and that is still true, is that people can make their money in illegal activity, uh, but because the Jamaican state is actually fairly poor and doesn't provide infrastructure reliably to all the neighborhoods, for example, in Kingston, what happens is you have sort of local gangsters, or they're often called dons, like as in and taken from the Godfather, who will literally provide running water for a neighborhood and like get people, kids, you know, uh, you know, school fixed up and like do the kind of infrastructural things that the government in theory is supposed to be doing. Uh, it doesn't mean they're not also doing lots of other things that are maybe not so great and it's not like they're, you know, bastions of equality and joy, but they do literally provide certain kinds of infrastructure at the very local level, level for certain kinds of communities. And they become influential in local politics. They're often called community leaders and they speak for the community, but their money and their power comes usually from illegal activities, often uh, the drug trade and um, guns and, and things like that. Uh, but what Obika Gray said was, it's really interesting how much power they have even uh, to resist uh, government intervention in their activities and to supplant in certain ways 
government activities, and in a way they seem to be relied on by the government. And this happens, this does happen explicitly in the 1970s when basically in a bid for popular support, both political parties in Jamaica start basically recruiting from neighborhood gangs to say, if you support my party, I will support your community. And, you, and this is where the, the beginning of partisan violence happens in Jamaica because they arm their supporters and their supporters uh, election times start to become very violent. Um, so uh, what's interesting and what Gray talks about is that the places where these gangs and these community leaders are powerful are places where their power does not actually derive from the support of the state. The state actually comes to them to keep the peace or to control things in these communities. And he calls the spaces in which these people are in power are exilic spaces because their power derives from relationships to each other that are not uh, dependent on the colonial state. Again, it doesn't mean they're automatically equal and liberatory, but they are to some extent independent of uh, the colonial state. And what I started thinking about was the ways that these street parties in a way are places where First of all, a lot of dons will sponsor street parties as well, but people interacting in these spaces are doing things that are not legal by copyright law or other standards in ways that really affirm their sense of identity in ways that the state can't really control and also doesn't have a, a substitute for it. That is, they articulate Jamaican-ness and, and in a way that is actually the most powerful articulation of what it means to be Jamaican. And in a lot of ways, these are collective interdependent uh, iterative and cyclical sort of processes of, of engaging with culture that in that process generate a kind of shared sense of identity. And so one of the things that, that connected to the Obika Gray idea is that um, this is possible, this identity is, remains rooted in the poor because they are in bad neighborhoods, they are in dangerous places, they are in poor areas that have a negative reputation. And it's actually that negative connotation that protects them in a certain way from being uh, um, gentrified and extracted and colonized and redrawn. And so um, what is interesting is how the, the loud sounds and the tall speakers uh, by virtue of just being loud and taking up space, sort of maintain this exilic aspect of Jamaican popular music. They reinforce the, the, the fact that they are going to be outside of certain ideas about what is a respectable way to engage uh, with each other and with public space. Uh, and respectability is actually one of the most powerful kind of class um, engines of, of maintaining class distinction in Jamaica. Uh, so by being rude, by being disrespectful, uh, unrespectable, I should say, uh, you're making actually a pretty powerful statement that critiques how the Jamaican social order is maintained. And what's really striking when you look at Jamaican popular music is that different references to rudeness are incredibly important all the way through Jamaican um, popular music. So from ska, where you have the rude boys, literally the rude boys, which are uh, young men who are uh, often, again, making their money in um, illegal or semi-legal or extra-legal ways who are ready to fight and who are, usually, who are ska fans, uh, uh, claiming this rudeness as a kind of badge of honor to, when I was there in 2009, um, one of the most famous uh, pop and popular dancehall stars was a guy named Mavado who called himself the Gully God. And the Gully is a um, kind of an open sewer that runs through streets in Jamaica. It is not a nice thing, but it is a thing that marks a sort of undesirable location. And so by claiming gulliness, uh, it, it kind of shows the sort of importance of embracing exactly the repellent aspect of sort of non-respectability or unrespectability uh, against the way that claiming respectability would incorporate you into the system. Uh, and so, um, this kind of concept of exilic space is what made me really think about how, uh, um, how it seems to be important for oppressed communities to be able to maintain control over their cultural practices uh, against the interests of the state and outside of the assumptions of the state about the proper way to interact with culture or with public space, with city streets, uh, with these air, you know, the, the vibrations of the air, right, the proper level of, of, of sound that one should be emitting, uh, that kind of thing. Also, the kinds of dances that people do in these spaces uh, were discussed as improper and excessive 
continually over the course of uh, Jamaican popular music's history. Uh, so there's all different ways that people's lack of propriety paralleling their lack of respect for property rights, intellectual and physical, <laughs> work together to solidify a kind of identity um, that uh, people claim it, people claim as valuable and good within these spaces. Um, and so to take it back to copyright law, copyright law is not actually a very powerful way to defend that identity, which is part of why I think people don't make use of it very well, because the terms of the copyright law sets for musicians requires that you engage with music in a particular way that Jamaican music mostly doesn't. Uh, so um, uh, a lot of what my uh, research was about um, in practice, I spent, I have a chapter in the book that is on street dances and how people are claiming and maintaining space. What are the things that, that affect who is centered or not centered in these spaces and how do those things persist over time and what kinds of things could change them. So I have a chapter on that. I have a chapter on particular musical forms that are very popular in Jamaica, like rhythms, which is basically the instrumental part of a song which gets reused over and over again by new artists uh, or by old artists who want to reuse the instrumental part of the song. Rhythms are fundamental to Jamaican music. So when you hear Jamaican popular music now, you will often hear someone singing a melody over a song, which is a rhythm, which is 20 or 30 years old. And that's not considered cheating and it's not considered unoriginal, uh, even though it is a violation of copyright law, uh, technically to do that if you don't get permission. Uh, and so rhythms are one of these ways of maintaining a shared cultural heritage through shared knowledge of these sounds and, and patterns over time. Uh, but if you want to claim copyright ownership, you can't be using somebody else's rhythm. So you have to break your relationship to that history in that community to be proper within the current copyright system. So this kind of takes me into the one of the um, aspects of my analysis that is through a lot of my work, which is sort of what are the advantages and disadvantages of being visible to the law or being recognized by the law. Because if the law only recognizes you if you destroy your relationships to your culture and your community, it's not gonna be a very empowering situation. Uh, so it's not to say that Jamaican musicians don't deserve more money than they get, or in fact, all Jamaicans don't deserve more money than they get. But one of the conclusions of my book is that there isn't really a way for copyright law as written to provide uh, the kind of redistribution of resources that are really relevant for those communities because people will have to take apart their creative practices and rewrite them in a way to fit with the law, which doesn't have any relationship to why the motivations for why people are doing these musical practices in the first place. Uh, uh, so uh, the only thing I would say in terms of what, how could we, or how, you know, how could the problems, the financial and other problems that people face be addressed is, I think it's not an accident that people are, are usually encouraged to look to copyright law to solve these problems because that is an individualist and sort of entrepreneurial and, 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 uh, um, and very capitalist way to frame how you, you better a community. But in fact, the communities that are disadvantaged in the Jamaican music industry are the urban poor. And so the kinds of things that would really solve their economic problems and their political problems are not really tied to recordings at all, but are tied to things like, well, people should have stable housing and clean water and you know reparations for slavery <laughs> and things like that. So I think um, part of what this book is about is I use copyright law as an analytic tool, but pretty much argue for minimizing it as a tool for redistributing wealth, because I just don't think it's designed to do that very well. Uh, people do, I think have made really interesting uses of copyright law to assert their rights. And I would never argue against that to anyone who wants to do that. Uh, but I'm always, I was struck by, for example, and I'll end here, uh, uh, I think, uh, with a conversation I had actually a couple different times that was fairly identical uh, with Jamaican producers, people who do make recordings. So they're the people who could conceivably be the ones who would want copyright law enforcement because they're actually they're at the recording process. They could charge for access, and they sometimes do charge for access to recordings. Um, but uh, I was asking them about these guys that I saw around town in Kingston. And this is in the just pre-digital uh, pre era for Jamaica, so it's different now. But when I was there, if you wanted to know what was hot musically in Jamaica, you had to go 
outside and go to a commercial area or maybe a gas station and there would be a guy who would be standing there with a stack of CDs uh, or a few stacks of CDs laid out on a, on a um, cloth. And those CDs would be mixed CDs with compilations of the hottest tunes that were that everybody was listening to in the street parties. And they came out every week and some DJs were at home making these selections and uh, informed by you know what was happening in the street dances. And because those were, th that stuff moved too fast to get on the radio. And a lot of it was never really gonna make it into any kind of commercial release, official commercial release. So these were like hand burned CDs with like handwritten and often not even any liner notes, not a lot of information. Uh, to, uh, metadata about what was on these CDs. Uh, and so those are also violations of copyright because those are not, the people making these CDs are not licensing those recordings uh, from the people that made them. But if you were an artist and you were up and coming, you really wanted your music to be on those CDs because that would mean that you were hot and people would start to know who you were and then they would book you for uh, your unique voice or sort of service that you could provide uh, through a one-time fee. But for a producer, producers, uh, you know, I thought maybe they would be unhappy about this. And so I said, well, look, you know, what about these CD guys? What about these CD sellers? Do you think, because they're, they're not, you know, all of these are unlicensed compilations. They're not paying anybody for these songs. Do you think that they, the copyright should be enforced, enforced against them? And the two or three producers I talked to this about, they all said, yeah, yeah, I think so. They probably should. And then I said, well, I've seen you know, because it's true, every, every few years the Jamaican state would get in a tizzy and they would say, we're going to crack down on all this copyright violation. And then they would round up all these CD sellers and confiscate all their stuff. And then, you know, like a, a few weeks later, they would be out there again with new CDs. So, uh, so I'd be like, well, you know, these guys are getting arrested. You know, is, would you like to see more of that? And to a person, at least the three people that I spoke to about this, were like, no, I don't really think they should be arrested. I mean, those guys are just trying to feed their families. But maybe, you know, there could be like a tax or something and some of that money could be, uh, you know, redistributed towards, and they didn't say redistributed, but should be given to the artists or the producers. Uh, and I thought that was really interesting because that was um, a recognition, both that they thought money should be distributed in different ways, but also that they weren't happy with the kind of punitive approach to copyright, which was the way the state was generally looking at it and that the law suggests, which is, yeah, if you make unlicensed compilations, you can be arrested and fined and your stuff, uh, your stuff taken away from you. And people I talked to in general, if the person doing the illegal act was also perceived to be poor, they said, we don't want this person to be deprived of their livelihoods. We want them to be able to have a livelihood. And that's not something that copyright law is concerned with. Like if you violate copyright law, your livelihood doesn't matter, right? So there was a way in which people were saying, we have some priorities here that the law doesn't really recognize, but that we think should be recognized, even in relation to our own potential self-interest. Um, and that was something that I just thought was, was very useful. Like if, if for people who do wanna tweak copyright law, I think you could do worse than ask people, in human terms about the human beings who are violating the law and what you think should happen to them. Because I think uh, certainly when I spoke to producers about wealthy foreign companies who released illicit uh, compilations of Jamaican music that circulated in like Sweden among Swedish, you know, among Swedish reggae fans, people were like, get that money, <laughs> you know, these guys shouldn't be making it. You know, they didn't have the same judgment for folks they perceived to be in the position of power and ease that they did for people within their own community. And that's not something that, that Western law is very good at recognizing, but it's something that a lot of people who are living under or in relation to Western law do have a strong interest in. And so part of what I kind of articulated at the end of my book is sort of how, how can we think about what it is that is actually best for communities on their own terms, rather than and, and, and center the values that, that make the music so exciting and so, um, so energetic and so powerful and influential. And I'm, I'm just taking it on faith that everybody here has heard some Jamaican music and knows how awesome it is. I, I mean, I know it makes it for a less fun presentation that I didn't play examples, but I was like, well, I might as well explain some theories because that doesn't always get explained. Um, but uh, if you don't, feel free to search out uh, or ask me for suggestions and I will happily give suggestions for my favorite Great music that's also a great example of some of the stuff that I'm talking about here. Um, but anyway, I think, you know, if anything, we should be trying to preserve great cultural practices that, uh, that people love and that serve them very well, rather than saying, well, they don't follow the law, so why don't we just start from scratch and create new cultural practices that 
conform to the law, which is what a lot of copyright scholars say. They're like, well, if everybody just signed a contract before they started making the songs, this would all be very clear. And you're like, well, yeah, have you hung out with musicians? Like, that's not a very realistic way to think about creativity. Um, and it's also why so many compilations of Creative Commons licensed music that is created to be licensed under a Creative Commons license is, this, a lot of those compilations aren't very good because people are making music in order to fit into a legal regime rather than because they have an intrinsic reason to be making the music. Uh, and so I think recognizing those intrinsic motivations gets us a lot farther. And when we're talking about people who have survived and flourished culturally, if not economically, in the face of colonialism and slavery, it's especially important to figure out how to facilitate their flourishing on their own terms rather than the terms of the entities that historically have colonized them. Uh, so I guess I'll, maybe I'll stop there since we seem to have some great questions. Great, thank you, Larissa. Um, yeah, can you all hear me? I'm not popping into my own speaker window, so I wasn't sure. Um, so yeah, our first question came from Nina. If you want to, uh, if you want to unmute and ask your question, Nina. Hi, Larissa. Hi, Nina. <laughs> I I was wondering about these, the poor communities with the exilic spaces you were talking about, and if you're aware of any examples of people um, breaking through to get that economic livelihood or be that crossover success from there, and if so, do they maintain that respect and connection to that original community? That's a great question. Um, and I, I, yeah, I did. This is great also because I didn't articulate this very clearly. But what's interesting is that all of this stuff around the the sort of class stratification that makes it makes it very difficult for upper class Jamaicans, for example, to to be creators within the Jamaica the urban uh, poor, and keeps urban poor people's music off Jamaican radio. Those dynamics are not the same outside of Jamaica. Uh, and I think this goes back to um, Jamaica being a plantation colony, right, where you have an, a local elite who, you know, because Jamaica is, is I mean, I don't know, you know, these definitions are complicated, but Jamaica is by the census like 95% black. Uh, and certainly people who are not black are much more likely to be in the elite, but there's also plenty of black people and what Jamaicans would call brown people who are in the elite side of Jamaica. Um, uh, that is much, much smaller, obviously, than the vast numbers of people who are very poor. Um, but uh, the thing that keeps those folks apart is not necessarily specifically skin color, but it is instead respectability and deportment. And Obika Gray also has a really great article about this, by the way, which I was really pleased to find, uh, where he talks about the failure of Jamaican radicals in the 60s to recognize that manners and style and deportment have to be undermined if you want to connect to uh, the, the masses, if you want to represent and include the masses in your revolution. Uh, because, uh, um, because there isn't this clear racial stratification, instead, uh, it's, it's uh, Jamaican elites are very hostile to being sort of mistaken for <laughs> the poor or being overly close to the poor. But in places like the US, which at least in the North is more of a settler colony situation where you have a black minority and a white majority, white majorities can't be threatened by being too close to black culture. White majorities can safely consume and engage with and try on and play around with black culture because being white, right, there isn't that, um, that anxiety uh, in the same way, that need for distance. It doesn't, it doesn't, you know, because you can take that off again, right, that's the sort of appropriation argument. And so Jamaican popular music, poor Jamaican popular music, musicians cross over quite a lot into Europe, into the US, into England, uh, much more so because there are more of them. There are many, many poor artists who become global stars because Europeans are not afraid to embrace this culture from poor people because they're not afraid they're going to compromise their own respectability by doing so. Being bohemian is kind of the privilege of upper class people. I found this, uh, of, of upper class foreigners, of non-Jamaicans. And I found this to be true for me when I was trying to go to Jamaican street parties because often upper and middle class Jamaicans would be like, why are you going down there? Like, why would you go to these places? And then sometimes they would say, oh, well, she's foreign, foreigners go, foreigners go to these places, right? And then the same on the other side, which is poor Jamaicans, 
when a, when an upper class Jamaican came would be like, what are you doing here? But when I came, they'd be like, oh yeah, she's foreign. She can, foreigners like our stuff, you know? So on both sides, there's this kind of an end run around colonial respectability that happens. But that doesn't mean, right, that it's liberating in terms of redistributing wealth because of how copyright works outside of Jamaica. So individual Jamaican artists go and become, start, make a lot of money individually uh, in England or touring Europe, but it doesn't translate into, it's not enough also money and it doesn't translate into uh, restructuring local, you know, poverty in Jamaica in any significant way. So I know that was very complicated. I hope that answers some of your question. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Um, Gus, I think you're up next. Hi. Um, thanks a lot. That was a really, really interesting um, and compelling talk. Um, I was just interested, I mean, this is kind of a very broad question, I guess, but just wondering about uh, if you could talk a little bit more about whether you think that the cultural attitudes towards copyright um, or how their, the attitudes sort of shape the aesthetics of the music and I know we're talking about like a huge range of music over like a you know decades long period of time so mm -hmm. I know that's kind of problematic but if there's something like any kind of thread running through there um, mm -hmm. that you you would um, identify and, and I and I guess yeah one of the one of the um, possibilities that I that I was wondering about was whether it affects um, the degree to which global musics have impact on on Jamaican music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, interesting. So I would say, um, uh, first, I think that I wouldn't say that there are cultural attitudes towards copyright in the sense that people are thinking about copyright, right? Like what's happening is that people are mostly not at all thinking about copyright. Because when they think about it, they actually aren't thinking about what copyright really is. They're thinking about what they think copyright is. But most of the time they're not, that's not on people's minds. But there is, there are cultural practices that have implications for copyright. And a lot of those couple cultural practices involve reuse and borrowing and repetition and reference. And this has to also has to also go back to the, I think, the importance of dancing and the fact that this music is centered on dancing and also on the fact that this is a a much more like an oral tradition in a sense that, that, that people are engaging. Uh, with the music th often using a lot of memory skills. And so repetition is really important for memory skills and also for dancing, you need to know what's coming. So like the structures of songs tend to repeat over and over again so that you know how to move next. Uh, you know, and it sort of invites the audience in. This kind of shared knowledge invites the audience in. So Jamaican music started with, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a colonial place, right? So Mento started with the instruments of colonization, right? You had like a fife and a drum from military <laughs> bands, from British military bands in there. When you start getting into ska, it's people covering American R&B and some country and songs they hear on the radio, right? So it's always, I mean, it's a, you know, it's not an isolated, it's a small island, but it's not an isolated place. It's embedded in these networks. And so, yeah, as, as music filters into Jamaica uh, from the radio and then later from the internet, people are always incorporating sounds they hear into their own songs. Uh, and once you get to the digital era where people can do this through reusing samples, yeah, there's a ton of that. So like the 90s, 90s Jamaican dance hall has like uh, samples of music and, and snippets of music from all over the world showing up in it. At the same time, the music is going global and you start to get foreign people getting into dance hall and coming to Jamaica to get that authentic Jamaican sound. So you start getting Japanese dance hall singers coming to Jamaica to get kind of validated by the local scene. And again, they have to go to poor neighborhoods to get that, which is very interesting. But the, um, the um, cycling and repurposing is definitely, uh, I, I'm sure the people who have studied the specific logics at specific times, but all I can say is when you look at it over time, I mean, it's very omnivorous, things cycle through all the time. So what, and, and, and especially with American pop, any song that is big in American pop music, there will be a, a, a dance hall version of it, like, within a week, probably by Elephant Man, to be honest. Um, but like, like there's one guy in particular who just always, so like Beyonce had a song called Halo the last time I was in Jamaica that came out. Uh, and, and within like, it seemed like three days, Elephant Man had done a song where, he's, where he was reusing the instrumental and singing his own lyrics on top of it. 
Uh, but like, and that happens all the way back to like there's covers, but also reusing the instrumental. Um, so one of the pieces I use a lot in my talks that I've done in the past, and I almost did it today and then, then didn't because I felt like I'd done it so many times. <laughs> um, although it's a new audience, so I probably should have done it, is there's a, there's a great um, remix of a American pop tune from 2009, hip hop tune called This Is Why I'm Hot. And there's a remix that brings in a Jamaican vocalist and adds some new samples in it. Uh, and in my mind, it's better than the original, but also you need to hear the original to know how much better the new one is, right? So it's a way of improving it that requires unoriginality in order to be good, which again, I think is part of how, what is so interesting and subversive of the way to make a music kind of musical traditions incorporate uh, new things, is that they incorporate it by putting it in dialogue with old things. Uh, and that's actually more interesting in some ways than kind of ignoring the past and just going on to the next thing, in my opinion. So, so I hope that answers some of my question. Great, we have um, Kim up next, I think. Yeah, um, so, I, so you mentioned that Sean Paul is more popular outside of Jamaica than within Jamaica, and that if you're a middle class Jamaican musician, you might find yourself on the outside of very important, sort of important Jamaican music scenes. And so I'm just wondering if there's a conversation going on about musical, like class-based ideas around music, musical authenticity, and if this is something that you talk about in your book, or if other musicians talk about this, this idea that you have to be from a certain class to perform this music authentically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I talk about it when I'm talking especially about sort of the who controls access to these cultural spaces and so that's where I have like some some quotes from the different some different people talking about sort of feeling comfortable or uncomfortable in the studio or in other places um I don't it's not a, the concept of authenticity is in my book in a certain extent at least authenticity on the terms that you know, the way people in the scene would define something as authentic um but it's hard to say uh what people consider authentic or not because i didn't i didn't ask that question all the time and i think it's partly that's probably my own quirk which is that as someone who was involved in music for a long time in a music scholarship uh, i also am sort of became kind of probably hypersensitive and deeply allergic to the way that a lot of music writers fight about music and what really is and isn't this or that or the other thing like there's a lot of ways that people do that just to kind of like, I just think of it as kind of masculine gatekeeping of like being an expert, having to sound like an expert. And I am so overloaded with hearing those kind of conversations that I didn't want to talk to a bunch of producers about what they thought really was or wasn't something because I felt like, yeah, for me, I've just heard too many of those kind of arguments. I think it's an interesting question, but I couldn't bring myself to go <laughs> to go there in this in this work. But what was interesting, and I feel like where I got to it was, um, it was more in the silences and in the body language around when people talked about different kinds of artists. So this is one of those things of like ethnography where I feel like you just have to read and decide whether you trust my assessment of other people's silences and body language. And I may be totally wrong. Like that's the danger of ethnography, right? But like, I noticed that like Sean Paul was, was almost never played when I went to street dances in 2009. Uh, and when I asked about it, people were sort of like, literally like, hmm like literally would go sort of go sideways, would look off, would like, you know, and like, and I could have, and it's also, you know, like there are times, you know, it's not like you, you, you should avoid making people uncomfortable with your questions if you're doing research. I think discomfort is fine, but like it's, it's productive sometimes. But I was just interested in how there were these kind of vaguenesses around who was seen as important and that that vagueness seemed to have a pattern to it. And certainly when I was in England and I went to a big, it wasn't a illegal street party, it was like a formal festival, but Sean Paul was there and he was like a god. And even Jamaicans in England seemed to be more excited about him there in that context than I saw Jamaicans in Jamaica being excited about him. And so that was very, very interesting to me. Um, it, it, it seems to me still, and I mean, I haven't been back in the past couple of years, but it still seems to me that when you look at the big dance hall events within Jamaica, the big names are still not middle-class artists. That's a little, that's different in reggae, however, uh, like a more sort of classic rootsy reggae and dub, which is there is a big resurgence of more middle-class artists. Um, I think uh, like Chronix and John Nine and um, uh, a bunch of other folks who are very much using kind of militant 
1970s era languages, but language, but from themselves come from, from a middle class background. I don't write about that. That actually happens after my book, but I think it's super interesting and I really hope people will write about it because I think it's super interesting. Uh, I think next we have David Sussman. Uh, hi, uh, I just want to say I'm really excited about the work. I think it's really, really interesting and you're bringing together, I mean, just a ton of really interesting questions and I'm um, looking forward to the book. Thank you. Um, you know, I wanted to ask about temporality, sort of build up a little bit more on, on temporality in a different sense and thinking about copyright mm -hmm. as also uh, something that has to do with, temp with temporalities. And I, I, I'm, I don't know if this is a productive question or not. And so if it's not, you can just like dismiss it. But um, copyright is also uh, generally um, a monopoly for a limited period of time. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering how much that plays into the um, way that Jama the ways that Jamaican musicians are thinking about um, copyright or not. I mean, do, do they care about limited monop limited periods or not? Uh, do they think, oh, well, if something's old enough, then it's fair game, uh, you know, sort of dismissing the, the idea of a, of a of limited, limited monopoly or, um, I don't that's, know, just like to hear your thoughts on that. That's, no, it's a super interesting question. I think um, part of the issue here is um, because copyright was generally unenforced on the island at all until the the Copyright Act was rewritten in ninety three, and even and even then, it's not it's not generally enforced in any explicit way. So people don't really have an experience of uh, royalties uh, in a predictable way. And you know, like the, the idea of making money off music is more somebody's making money off it, and I need to get some of that money. It, there isn't a like this many you know this many things were sold, and therefore I'm entitled to this much after this amount of time. Like it isn't so. Um, uh, predictable. And then the other side of that is that, and this is maybe a testament to the, like the just bananas productivity of uh, Jamaican music. Since copyright now, now lasts for life of the author plus 50 years, I mean, the Jamaican music industry is barely that old. Do you know what I mean? So like everything that we're talking about is technically still covered, or most of the things we're talking about are technically still covered by copyright. So it doesn't seem, you know what I mean, the concept of it expiring doesn't seem so so clear for people because it you know for most people it, it 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 never it hasn't been enforced in the first place so there's nothing to get back but then there's again no experience of it really expiring because it wouldn't have expired for most people you know who you know who or their heirs who are alive i mean part of it is i think the the level of sort of uncertainty economic uncertainty at base that most poor jamaicans are experiencing all the time is so vast that like the kind of uh, numbers game that copyright really is of like, you know, you have to sell a lot and then you have to have it be collected and then it has to come back to you. That all relies on a lot of infrastructure which has never really existed in Jamaica. Do you know what I mean? So like even when songs sold a lot, usually what happened is an artist would get really mad and go back to the producer and be like, I heard that song everywhere. I need more money. And the producer would be like, well, okay. And they would pull out some money. Do you know what I mean? They wouldn't be like, here's your royalty sheet, you know? And uh, yeah, it's longer now, sorry. Um, uh, thank you, Sarah. Sarah, who is an actual lawyer in Jamaica, so she can probably be more specific, says uh, um, uh, people don't follow that there's a systematic practice in any particular way, a systematic stream, you know? And, uh, and again, there's also, you know, there's a good tradition in Jamaica, not good, but there's a tradition in Jamaica of getting money up front, which is reasonable, especially when you're poor and you don't know what the odds are of your song selling. So people are as used to getting paid up front one time as they are to waiting around for royalties, which might or might not come. Uh, I can just give one other example of that before we have time for one more question, maybe, which is um, I asked a lot of people, when was the first time you ever signed a contract, which was a really fun question to ask people in the music industry. And again, the body language alone was amazing because it was always, it seemed to be a kind of embarrassing question for people, which was interesting. And the kind of stories I heard about what it was like to sign a contract very much contradict the, the assumption that you have in the States when people say, get it in writing, you know, get it in writing is the thing that makes everything clear and then your rights are clear. But like, I remember talking to a guy who said, yeah, so the first time I signed a contract, well, I'd done a song with this guy and I was like, hey, you know, I wanna know, uh, you know, I wanna know what's going on with this song. 
so we'd already done the song, right? And the guy's like, okay, so um, meet me at this train station and I'll bring you the contract and you can sign it. And like they, he shows up at the train station. This is in London, the Jamaican was in London because, and so was the, the producer was in London. And the guy like whips out a, a, a contract and the music industry contract, you know, amid the hubbub of the train station was like, my train's leaving soon. So can you just read this and sign it? And the guy's like, so I signed it. And I was like, how'd that work out for you? And he's like, mm. you know what I mean? So there's nothing about the sort of structure of the legal system. That wasn't an unusual story at all from, from, from my perspective, although you know, maybe it's changed. Like a lot of stories were like that, where contracts were sort of mysterious, symbolic ex interactions that happened that didn't actually seem to reassure people that much, and rightfully so, because they didn't necessarily produce more certainty afterwards either. The things that produced certainty were close social relationships that were built up over time, right? So the person you would sign a contract with was the same person you probably could trust even if you didn't sign a contract. And if you sign a contract with someone you didn't trust, they probably would rip you off anyway, right? So all of those structures um, take on a different meaning, I think, in the, in the context, but I would be grateful. Yeah, so Sarah again saying the history here is contracts were not liberating anyway, so people wouldn't want to, uh, to sign them because they didn't mean anything good when you did. Uh, and so I think that is important. Like it's a reasonable hostility to the legal legal institutions. It's built on historic experience, you know. And again, I would say looking at the history of where these laws are from, why would you expect them to be in your interest if you're if, it's, if the laws were written by colonizers, right? So the 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 details of the law are are far beyond what most people are envisioning when they think about these these structures. Um, thank you so much Sarah, for for sharing that info in the chat. Um we have a we have sort of a, a good follow-up question to that one from lizzie cooper davis if she's still here to ask it i, Maybe not. I see it in the chat it's about alternative practices around ownership and reward for cultural works um yeah i have looked at that in other contexts that is there are other kinds of ways that people are defining for example like traditional knowledge and folklore and those kinds of things um but I would say in the Jamaican context, one problem is, or one difficulty, I should say, is most of the people who are involved in the popular music industry see themselves as legitimate players in the music industry who, plan, who would like to win a Grammy and like be in the music industry. So they're not at least interested explicitly in arguing that they are different from other kinds of pop music. That is not necessarily, not everyone says this, but that's, it's definitely, you know, people are, people are saying they are in the music industry. They just sort of assume or, or elide or kind of leave a little gray area around what that means for specific practices that they have that are actually technically illegal within that industry, right? So the alternate practices are just sort of the ones that have always existed, which is again, yeah, Maybe you sign a contract, but really what you do is if you know where the producer lives and you hear the song is doing well, you go bug the producer until they give you money. That is the alternative. It doesn't have to be about ownership. It has to be about the sense of what is owed you. I will say too that there are changes in copyright law that are happening in different places that could also serve some of these functions. So you have, you know, in England and the US, there are revisions that create a producer's right or a session musician's right. I like these tweaks because they break apart the assumption that copyright law has anything to do with creativity and just say, look, you did some work, you deserve money because you were part of the process. <laughs> like rather than mystifying it around originality or whatever, I'm like, yeah, why don't we just say, oh, uh, we've collected a lot of money and we can just have a musician's healthcare fund. This is one of the things that's so appalling about the, as Jack Lerner and I were just talking about, right, about the Music Modernization Act, right, is that the MMA collects funds, but if people don't claim them, it just redistributes those funds to people who are already members of the collection group. They could be redistributing that to people who don't have money and need it, you know, to musicians who are impacted by climate change or who need healthcare or whatever, right? So those kind of alternatives, I think we could be fighting for those and that would probably be good, you know, carve-outs within the system that take away all of this kind of mystification around, you know, the idea that copyright is somehow intrinsically related to the motivation to create, which I think is just not historically accurate um, or presently accurate either, so. Um, I'm gonna claim the prerogative to insert a question of my own here. Um, just because you referred to, um, you referred to things like the big CD sales and that kind of thing as pre-digital era practices. Mm -hmm. 
and I think it's really interesting to ask like how the digital era has affected all of these things mm -hmm. in Jamaica and particularly like is there a sense of portions of the internet that are in some ways their own exilic spaces and how do those concepts relate to each other? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, yeah, so my research was mostly done before that. So I can't root it in lots of field work, but I can say that I have I have a sense that the changes are mixed. And part of it is because there's ways in which network digital technology, and this is something, the article that I attached in the um, announcement that's about uh, networked um, video cameras in, in the street dance kind of goes in this direction. Network digital technologies also bring in the possibility of surveillance by, for example, copyright owners. So it's only exilic if, if it's not surveilled. <laughs> and, you know, or you know, if you can, you have to be invisible or obscure or under the radar or out of sight uh, or, you know, whatever it is. So I think that's my concern about online interactions is that to a great extent, the internet has been captured by privatizing corporate interests that don't facilitate those kinds of things. And then with the revision of, you know, the, DM, the DMCA made it so that even trying to circumvent those protections is in itself illegal, right? So it's really a move to, to you know, I would say at the beginning era, before that, you know, in the Napster era and the Limeware era, those weren't automatically silly places. There were certainly a lot of rich people sharing uh, their own and poor people's cultures. There's some lot of white people sharing cultures of, of, of you know, black and brown people and, and people in the global south. You know, and that's not automatically, I think, liberating or, or subversive, but it was invisible, which meant other people could also be sharing if they were connected to the internet. The problem is fewer people were online back then. It was not accessible to poor communities in that way. So I think it's not really an accident. Like the point at which it becomes more accessible, it also becomes less flexible in those ways. Um, certainly now, I mean, like the last time I was in Jamaica, people have switched very much to DJing using digital technology and one, one thing that is true too is like people have vast memory, you know, hard drives uh, of music, which I'm sure they have not paid for, which is, you know, been true. How that's circulating and who controls it, I don't know enough to know. And I would like to know more about that. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I was in a studio even back in 2009, you know, and people would call up and just say, do you have this rhythm? Do you have this rhythm? And he would pull it up, you know, either in his, in his computer or, he would pull up a, a tape or a, a, a CD or something and say, yes, I have these things. And you needed to have them if you wanted to be of use to people who wanted to join in to this shared cultural heritage that um, Sarah's referring to in the comments. So I think, you know, the digital era isn't automatically liberating. It has capacities for it. And that's part, again, that's part of what, like, I'm not, I'm not writing about music as, like, automatically being liberating. I'm saying there's conditions under which it is more or less. And one of those things is sort of how visible it is, how, how, how surveilled it is, or how much, who, you know, on who, who's controlling the terms in which things circulate. So I think that's the question to be asked in the digital era. I haven't investigated enough to know the answer, but I think you're right to say that's the question. I would just say, I'm not particularly hopeful because of who's designing the technologies, right? That is, it's not, you know, all the great stuff that's come about with new technologies in the digital era has mostly come about because people who were not the original designers start using it in ways that were unexpected. And as soon as that gets noticed, it gets re incorporated and regulated and all the liveliness is usually gone, right? So I think unless we're really conscious about designing other tools, that's gonna continue to happen. I would love for like the ju design justice people to take this on, uh, you know, how do we think about music creativity in a global digital network in a way that doesn't just reinforce current systems, but I don't know if that's happening or not. Um, I think there are really interesting pockets of creativity, but they again often involve being lower tech because it's less surveilled. So that's what I would, I guess where I would stop with that. Thank you. Um and I hate to cut us off at the point where I've just had my question answered, but we're at that time. Um, so thank you so much, Larissa, um, for thank this you. amazing presentation. I just want to re remind everybody um, that next week, December 8th, we have Kim Mack, our own Kim Mack, um, talking with Emily Lordy about her new book, Fictional Blues, 